Hello everybody and welcome back to Sustainable Small Holding France. I'm Lorraine and this video is going to detail the 10 steps to self-sufficiency. Now, why have I got creating a kitchen garden as the first step? Well, basically because we've all got to start somewhere and whether you're ready to go on a journey uh, on a small holding or small farm or if you just have a balcony or a kitchen windowsill or a normal size average suburban garden, this is a great place to start. It will get you into the mindset of growing. It will let you think seasonally. It will save you money and you'll also be able to grow things that perhaps you can't find in your local shops. Uh, Apart from saving money, there's the achievement of growing and harvesting your own food. Um, hopefully, you won't be using any pesticides or insecticides to do that, and it will be fresh. And there's nothing quite like pulling your own carrots out the ground or picking an apple off your own tree. So that is where I would suggest everyone starts. It's low cost, it's reasonably low maintenance, and it will boost your confidence. So the second step is having a look at your water supply. Now, in a developed world, we have the luxury of being able to turn a tap on and we have clean water instantly. But that's an expensive way to go forward if you're planning on having a kitchen garden or, in fact, if you're going to have animals on a small holding or small farm. Now, we are uh, in southern France and we have a drought every summer. So as a consequence of that, and for good planning reasons, we now have water recuperators or water collection points all over our land. So we use uh, IBC containers. They're a thousand litres and they're about 120 euros. So it's about 100 pound, 110 pound each for a used one. Uh, no doubt you can find them cheaper in the UK. They seem to be very expensive here in France. But these are ideal to situate at the back of your house or the back of your garage or shed with downpipes to collect water from your roof. Uh, and that way you will have a ready supply of water. If you have a borehole or a well, congratulations, you lucky people. Um, but using mains water. Number one, it's expensive. And number two, I actually have an issue with that because there are people in the world who don't have access to any clean water supply. And it bothers me if I use tap water to water my garden. Uh, I do use tap water for drinking water for my animals, but I don't use tap water for my garden, for my orchard, for cleaning my car, for washing out my animal sheds. Uh, I use uh, recovered water from um, our roofs. So step three is changing your mindset. Now, if you're starting small and you're just starting with a kitchen garden or you want to have an allotment, maybe a greenhouse in your garden, you won't see much change apart from inside here. Now, You'll be content with growing your own fruit and vegetables. It shouldn't take you that much time and it won't intrude really on your personal life. You can make time after work. You can make time at the weekends for it. But the further you go in your self-sufficient journey, the more time and the more involvement that makes. Now, I've spoken to a lot of people who have jumped into small holding from absolutely no farming background at all. I'm one of them. I was not brought up in a farming background. My parents didn't farm, and for the last few generations, no one has been involved with working on the land. It was a complete shock to my system to understand the difference between what my vision of small holding would be like, the one in my head where there's blue skies, it never rains, animals never get sick, and I'm going to happily work on it. Nothing's going to go wrong and it will just pay for itself to the reality of being out at night in the rain. I just finished lambing now. That meant getting up every three hours in the night to check on sheep. 
Uh, I have to go out when it's cold, when it's frosty, when it's snowing to clean and feed animals. I have animal emergencies. Um, I have crop failures. Um, I have everything happening at the end of summer when harvest time happens. It's not what you see in the movies. This is real life. And one of the things that you need to think about, especially if you are in a couple or in a family, is that your aspirations are the same as everyone else in your family group. Because if they're not, you're going to either end up doing all this on your own or you're going to have a very resentful partner and possibly children. It is not an easy life but it is a very rewarding one. And how far you go on your small holding journey or your self-sufficiency journey is entirely up to you. There's no pressure on you. This is your choice. And if you start doing it and you find out that you don't like it, then stop because it is not worth it for your mental well-being. Now, anyone starting in self-sufficiency usually starts with fruit and vegetable growing, they tend to move on to chickens, which is the kind of gateway animal into uh, small holding or homesteading. And then they move on to larger animals like sheep or goats or pigs. Now, no one can make your journey for you. This is your journey and you have to decide what you're comfortable with, how much you want to spend, how much time you want to spend on it and what you're prepared to do. Now, you might not want to keep animals for meat. That's fine. You might want to just grow your own fruit and vegetables, maybe keep some bees. I don't know. This is your journey. This video is just here to make you stop and think about what you're doing and to plan it. And please talk to your significant others. Find out what their views are because it's a hard journey to do it on your own. So here we are at step number four, choose your staple. What do I mean by that? Not everyone can do everything. It's just not humanly possible. And especially if you've got a very small area to be self-sufficient in, you've got to concentrate on one thing or another or a couple of things. Here in my small holding, I have just over four acres and most of that is pasture for my sheep. So sheep is one of my staples. The reason why I like sheep, I've always liked sheep, but they give me wool and they give me meat. And I'm not sentimental about it. Uh, I do have cuddles with the lambs and I scratch the sheep's head, but they are there for a reason. And the reason is they keep the grass down during the summer and keep the soil in good nick. They fertilise it as they munch. It saves me going out and cutting it all down. And then at some point, about six months into their life, then we take them and they are converted into meat for the freezer. So sheep are one of my staples, always has been. And the other staples that I have here are my kitchen garden. It's an essential part of what we do. And I use the fruit and vegetables growing in there for eating raw, eating in salads, cooking with, to make wine or beer or whatever, and to preserve for winter use. Uh, and the last but equally important to the other two is my orchard. Now, apples are incredibly versatile. I, I just cannot sing their praises enough so i get lovely blossom in the spring that attracts uh, uh, insects that pollinate other things then i get apples to eat from august right through till december i can pick an apple off the tree uh, so i can have dessert fruit i have cider trees so that i can have fruit for making into cider I can make it into juice i can ferment apples into wine i can cook with them they are just so, so versatile and I can swap them with other people for what their surplus is. So, so saving seeds is the next step and this is a brilliant way to save money. Uh, I save seeds of 
peas, beans, and um, I do some strawberries and wild strawberries. And, and I propagate uh, new plants the following year from that. The only seeds that I don't save are um, from squashes such as courgettes, butternut, and any uh, pumpkins or whatever that I grow. Uh, because when they are fertilizing and setting seeds, you can make yourself ill if you have your own seeds. So always buy proper shop bought seeds for that but as far as flowers are concerned you can save loads and loads of seeds from flowers apples i always create my own i grow my own rootstocks and i then graft from the trees that i have here growing graft the scions onto the rootstocks and that way i can propagate new trees um, and that works with all fruit trees so you can do that with apples pears cherries plums it's a really easy way to save money and, of course, if you have too many. Is there any such thing as having too many fruit trees? But if you do, then you can swap them with your friends or your neighbours uh, for other things or you can sell them at farmer's markets or stalls. So save your own seeds, folk. It will save you a lot of money. So step number six is grow your own protein. And although this may be a wee bit emotive for some of you, there is nothing quite like producing your own meat. This is what I mean by growing your own pro protein. If you have a pond or a river, then yes, you may start to uh, farm some of your own fish. But what we're really talking about in self-sufficiency terms is having animals for meat. As I said earlier, most people start with chickens and most people keep chickens for eggs. But as you go on in your self-sufficiency journey, you may decide to get dual purpose birds from which you can get uh, a good supply of meat. Uh, it's not chickens alone. You can keep ducks. Some people keep geese. Done that. Won't we'll do that again. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but they're quite aggressive and you only get one meal out of a goose, so geese are not for me. Uh, ducks were great and there's nothing quite like watching ducks messing about in the yard and the grass and if you've got water, in water. But chickens are a good source of meat. Um, obviously, we keep sheep and our sheep uh, from when they're born in January, they graze our land, so they're just grass-fed sheep up until the grass dies off. Now, this isn't so much a problem in the UK, but over here in France, we get a lot of drought from the middle of July through till about September. And most people here, if they have sheep, they lamb them in January. So you'll get six to seven months of the lambs growing and putting on weight. And then it's a case of deciding whether you're going to keep any animals for breeding or if you're going to use them for filling your freezer. Now, an average lamb at six months will give you 20 odd kilos of meat which is not to be sniffed at, and we like home-produced lamb. We know how the, the lambs have been raised. We know what they've been eating. We don't really use antibiotics or anything like that here, so we know that we are eating pretty ecologically friendly meat. Uh, it's the same with pigs. If you have a couple of porkers in, um, start them off as wieners, and then again, they'll go to meat. And the same with goats. There's a rising demand, especially in the UK, for goat meat. So if you have a surplus, you could swap it for uh, other things or you can sell it. So not everybody's comfortable with raising animals for meat, which is why in the little slide before this segment of video, I have put the lovely fluffy lambs beside the realistic shots of meat. So... You have to square your conscience with that and you need to decide that before you get animals. If you want the complete journey, um, then you'll process them for meat. And if not, then you have to decide whether having animals really is for you. 
Uh, cows obviously produce milk, but not all smallholders have enough land to keep a house cow. Uh, but milk can give you an awful lot of products. You get milk, cream, butter, and cheeses. So there's a lot to think about there. And as I said at the start of the video, the whole point of this video is to make you sit and think about where you're going with your self-sufficiency journey and what you want to do with it. Now, even if you... Okay, so the next step is clearing your debt. And you may sit and look at this video and say, well, I don't have any debt. Everyone has debt. So if you have a house, you will probably have a mortgage. If you're renting a house, then you have your rental to pay every month, which is a sort of debt. If you have a car, you may have bought it on finance, and that is debt also. So the whole point of this segment of the video is to get you to examine what you're paying in interest on things and how you can reduce that. Next one is animal management. And what I mean by this is everything from before you get your animals to after your animals die or you process them for meat. So you need to think about before you get them, you need to, if you live in the UK, get a county parish holding number, a CPH number. If you're in France, you need to get a cheptail number then you can start the process of uh, looking at everything else that you need to get. You need to keep veterinary records. You need to make sure that your animals are uh, vaccinated if that is a requirement. If you keep cattle, you'll talk about TB testing. And you need movement records and you need uh, ear numbers or slap, slap marks, whatever. So you need to think about everything that you need legally. I would also highly recommend if you are in the UK or in Europe to get some kind of insurance to cover you. Now, we have public liability insurance and that covers us if any of our animals escape or hurt anybody. So it's another thing to think about. You've also got to think about housing for animals. So if you have chickens, you'll need a coop. Probably you'll need an enclosure to keep them fox proof. And if you have ducks, they need access to water. Sheep, you'll need some sort of shelter. Always handy when you're lambing, guys, especially if it's got lights in it. Goats, goats need shelter, they don't like the rain and they like a nice warm environment, as do pigs, they need a shelter too. Cows can probably be out most of the time unless you're bringing them in in the winter so you don't have the ground poached or if you're milking them, you'll need to bring them in to do that as well. So, housing, lots of things to think about. Then you're talking about bedding. Uh, so we use straw for our sheep. We used to use sawdust uh, and wood chippings for our chickens and our ducks. And obviously, as that gets soiled, you need to dispose of that. So we'll talk about that in the waste section further on. Uh, what else do you need to know about animal management? Training. Please get some handling experience. It's all very well saying, oh, I'm going to be self-sufficient and I'm going to have chickens and I'm going to have sheep and all the rest of it. If you've never picked up a chicken, you need to deal with it. If you've never confronted an angry cockerel, please go and have that wonderful experience. And sheep, pigs, goats and cattle are large animals. Go and do an experience day to see if you are physically capable uh, of moving and dealing and uh, ringing and putting ear tags in, all that kind of stuff. I do lambing. It's knackering. At the end of lambing season, I'm shattered. There is no way I would ever think about having cattle because calving just fills me with dread. I think you need to be a lot younger and physically very able. My final word about animal management is reproduction, life and death. Now, <laughs> where you have animals, you're always going to have livestock and you're always at some point going to have dead stock. Now, 
if you buy young animals, and even if you're talking about chickens, you know, the hatching process, it's wonderful. It's filled with anxiety, but it's a wonderful process. I've just finished lambing. Absolutely wonderful. But the flip side to that is animals age and whether you have them for meat or not, at some point you're going to have to contemplate death. Now, let me give you an example. If you keep chickens, what are you going to do if a fox comes in? A fox comes in, he'll take a chicken and run away with it. Then you've lost a chicken and it's very sad. But if a fox or a dog comes in and kills two of your chickens and three of them are seriously injured, are you going to be capable of either taking it to the vet with the expense that that incurs, or are you going to be able to euthanize that animal and put it out its misery? I'll leave you to think about that one. If you're having animals for meat, then at some point you're going to have to get to that day where the animals go in the trailer and are taken away to be processed. Now, if you, like me, give your animals names, then you have to square yourself with that. Now, I'm perfectly fine about giving little Chloe the lamb or little uh, Fluffy the lamb a name, but I know ultimately in six months that little Fluffy is going to go and be killed and is going to come back as a bag full of meat ready for my freezer. You also have to think about how you're going to get rid of animal waste. Now, I'm lucky I've just done lambing and I've had no casualties or mortalities, but sometimes you will have a dead lamb and you need to find out what your local authorities process is for dealing with that. You cannot just put a dead animal in the rubbish. Chickens are a different thing. People roast a chicken, put the carcass in the bin. That's a different thing. But if you've had animals or birds, say you've had birds and they've died of bird flu, you need to get in touch with your local authority to find out what the process is for that because DEFRA will definitely want to know. If you have a uh, an outbreak of a disease, you need to inform the proper authorities as well. So just think about that when you're talking about animal management. And it's a lot to think about. Go on courses, as I say, you will gain invaluable knowledge uh, and you can move on from there. So working seasonally. I'm going to look back at the time that we lived in Cornwall because we did an awful lot more work on our small holding then. So if we take the start of the year, January, we're still chopping wood for the wood burner. So we've brought the wood down from uh, the woodlands and we've chopped and stacked it. It's dried out over the summer and sometimes we just have to cut it slightly smaller to fit in the wood burner. We're also doing machinery maintenance we're also repairing fencing. I'm checking that sheep have enough food. Uh, I'm checking that my bees have enough fondant on them to last them through to the spring. And I'm checking that uh, my chickens are quite happy and about to start a new laying season. Spring starts and I've got contract lambing, which I used to do as a job. And... I used to do a back shift with that, so I would be doing other things around the small holding, mainly to do with cider, I have to say. So I was uh, bottling and labelling my cider, getting that ready for sales in the spring, and uh, doing contract lambing in the evenings. John was doing uh, garden machinery maintenance. And then come the summer, we've got a bit of a lull where all we do is look after the vegetable garden and just check the orchard's quite happy. And then as the summer goes on, I'm checking the bees every week to make sure that they're not going to swarm, that they're quite happy. If it's been a damp summer, I need to check that they've got enough food on them. And then in the autumn, we're talking about uh, sheep going to the ram, uh, harvesting the apples and starting to process that for juice and cider and various bits and bobs as they kind of come along. 
so any ducks that would would hatch that would probably end up having to uh, slaughter them for the freezer at that point, and then you're rolling back into another year. So it is a cycle, and everybody's will be different. So whatever your self-sufficient journey is, you may just have your fruit and veg. So you're going to have early spring sowing, growing in the summer, harvesting and processing in uh, autumn, and uh, thinking about what you're going to do over the winter, plus putting a mulch or manure on your ground to put new goodness back into it. So have a think about working seasonally. Well, what a long video, and thank God we nearly end because I am gasping for a cup of tea. So, final thing, waste management, really quickly. You're going to have recycling waste, you're going to have paper waste, you're going to have plastic waste, you're going to have animal waste products, you're going to have human waste products. Now, we recycle a lot. We have specific bins, as I'm sure you do, and we do our bit for that. But on the small holding, we recycle all the waste out the sheep sheds. That goes straight into my composter or onto my raised beds in the winter so that it puts the nutrients back into the soil. The sheep out in the field will automatically graze, recycle that grass, poop it out as poop, and we can use that. Now, human waste... You can get a composting toilet if you so desire. Depends on how far along your self-sufficient journey you are and on your personal tastes and things like that. But we recycle human pee. Yes, urine is our friend. There is an actual video on how we use the urine as a compost accelerator and how we also use it for feeding various plants around the place. So you can go and have a look at that. I'll stick the link in the bottom in the comments here. And thank you for watching.